While art from the northern parts of Europe in the 16th century does have some continuity from the northern renaissance, especially in terms of what some artists are doing with style, there are definitely some distinctions between the two periods. The first thing that we should discuss is the attitude surrounding the close of the 15th century. So this we talked about with Italy as well, but fin de siècle, this kind of fancy French term, it's very often used to talk about kind of the anxiety and the turmoil that people feel as the century begins to draw to a close happens in the northern parts of Europe as well as the southern parts of Europe. So there are calls in the north for a lot of religious reform leading up uh, to the close of the century. People are like exhorting others around them to repent and get ready to meet the apocalypse because they're really kind of worried that that may be the case. And we do start to see those calls for greater religiosity impacting culture and impacting art even before we get to the Protestant Reformation. In the north, there are a lot of really devout individuals who are seeking to reform the issues that they see within the Catholic Church. And eventually this is going to lead us into the Protestant Reformation. We're going to talk about this in more detail, but right now just to kind of give you an overview, we need to understand that the Protestant Reformation is going to have incredible implications for the culture of the time, for the politics of the era, and of course, those changes in culture and politics and religion are going to shift into a change in art. So here you can see on this uh, bullet, on these bullet points, a lot of different things that will happen with art because of Protestant beliefs. And we're going to cover all of these as we go throughout the rest of this discussion. A lot of scholars talk about the fin de siècle attitude that was part of the era not really resolving as we move up into the beginning decade of the century. So we get into the 1500s, people should be feeling better, but they really don't uh, show that they're feeling better. And so we have a lot of calls for religious reform that continue even after the century has turned. And we are going to talk about Martin Luther's calls for religious reform as he's one of the most influential of these religious figures. In 1517, in Wittenberg, Martin Luther shares his 95 theses, and these are different issues that he sees within the Catholic Church that need reform. Okay, and according to legend, he posts these on the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral, where they're made kind of public. He has a lot of different ideas within, of course, this long list of issues. We're going to talk just about a few of the issues that have the most uh, consequences for us as we look at art. Okay, now first, in terms of religious belief and practice, Luther has a lot of problems with what he sees as a lack of adherence to the Bible within Catholicism. One of the most important issues he, he points out is that in Catholic tradition, there's a huge emphasis on rites and ceremonies as saving tools. Luther, on the other hand, says he believes the Bible is saying grace is the most important uh, aspect for salvation. We don't necessarily need, Luther saying, uh, all of these different rites and rituals and ceremonies that the Catholic Church emphasizes so greatly. Instead, Luther says, we need the grace of God to save us. Luther has problems with the sacraments within the Catholic Church, feeling that there are more sacraments practiced in the church than are actually in the Bible. Luther also has a problem with the veneration of saints within the Catholic Church. And instead of seeing them as intercessors that can plead on your behalf at your final judgment, Luther says the saints were just good believers. They don't have a special role. The only person that can save us is Christ. Uh, so you can see how these first three bullet points all kind of relate to that emphasis on the grace of Christ, right? You don't necessarily need all of these sacraments. You don't necessarily need all of these religious rites and ceremonies. You don't need the saints to intercede for you. What you need is you need Christ to save you himself through his grace. Now he goes on to kind of talk about how everyone should be able to read the Bible for themselves and interpret the Bible for themselves rather than relying on their priests to interpret that for them. 
And he also feels that really, instead of using images to teach the things from the Bible, to use his religious worshiping tools, people should be reading the Bible instead. So uh, these two bullet points go really closely hand in hand because he wants everyone to be able to read the Bible so they understand the, the doctrines of the gospel. He also thinks that that is the way to learn. We shouldn't learn from all of these religious images. So for Luther, he really feels like images didn't have a place in religious worship that they kind of took away from the focus on the Bible. He also felt that all the ostentation that surrounded these artworks in the church was kind of distracting from, uh, from viewers' focus on Christ, where he felt like the focus should be when they come to church. Beyond adherence to the Bible, Luther has other issues within uh, with the Catholic Church. He has problems with indulgences and the way that the church is granting forgiveness for sins if people pay certain indulgences to the church. He has a problem with the way the church is spending all the money that it, come, that it has coming in, feeling like there are a lot more worthy ways that the money could be spent to help uh, general just members of the clergy. He has problems with nepotism in the Catholic Church, so that's when people hire members of their family to fulfill to fill important positions rather than uh, choosing people based on their qualifications. And then he also really feels like, you know, the clergy should be leading lives of uh, exemplary behavior. And he really felt like that a lot of leaders within the Catholic Church weren't doing that. So he has problems mostly with uh, what's going on with the Bible, but he has other issues as well. Okay, now, Luther, we need to understand, is just one of many fundamental figures within the Protestant Reformation movement. And he actually has many followers. Uh, Jean Calvin is one of those we'll be talking about. But what we need to understand is that these calls for change did not inspire the, the response that Luther was hoping for. Luther was hoping that the Catholic Church would uh, reform itself. What happens instead is that Luther faces a lot of problems from, from the Catholic leaders for what he is proposing. And eventually, in about 1530s, the Protestants are going to have to separate themselves from the Catholic tradition. Uh, in the 1530s as well, we have the Anglican Church in England separating itself from, from the Catholic Church too. Now, this challenge to Catholic authority is hugely significant for understanding the era. We have to understand that the Catholic Church was the unifying factor of Europe. The Catholic Church was um, so powerful that even political leaders had to submit their will to, to the Catholic Pope. When we see the breakaway of the Protestants from the Catholic Church. And when we see particular countries and leaders becoming Protestant, this causes an incredible amount of turmoil. Not only ideologically, right? People have a lot of questions, what should I believe, who's right? But also politically and economically, this is gonna kick off a period for more than the next 100 years where we're going to see civil and religious wars all over the cause of religion. We get the 30 years war, we get the 80 years war, for instance. We get a really heavy emphasis on the Inquisition during this period as well. So there are, uh, you know, huge conflicts that are set off mostly based on these religious disagreements. The other thing that we need to realize that in addition to all the conflict that this sets off, we also start to see a real change in the way European politics function. We start to see a shift away from religious authority toward secular authority. Princes and rulers, they realize that they can turn Protestant, and when they do so, they can take control of all the Catholic lands, they can profit from all of those Catholic lands, and all that power that used to be taken by Catholic leaders could become theirs. So they could break away from the power of the Pope, um, and they could become more individually powerful. And in fact, we do see in the 16th century that the monarchy uh, does become more powerful as an institution during this period. So Calvin, as we said, was a follower of Luther. He's very strict, much more so than Luther, and uh, his followers become kind of a very sober society uh, that were, were really intense in a lot, of, a lot of ways. One thing we need to understand that separates Luther and Calvin is their outlook on imagery. Now, we've already kind of talked about how Luther said, you know, people should be focusing on the Bible to learn about Christianity rather than looking at religious artworks. Calvin had a more stringent attitude towards religious works, and he said, believers should not make any sorts of images of God. So he really kind of moved away from 
even having religious imagery at all, uh, whereas Luther was okay with the existence of religious Im imagery, though he didn't want it to be used as a religious tool. Now, neither Luther nor Calvin advocated that artwork should be destroyed, but there were followers of Calvin who listened to Calvin say nobody should make any religious images and took it in their own hands to kind of wreck artworks. Okay, the first uh, instance of this happens in the 1520s. And then we get uh, more instances of this in the 1560s. And these are called iconoclastic riots when this happens. And you can see here in this print uh, an, a kind of representation of, of individuals defacing the church, tearing down the sculpture, knocking out the stained glass. A lot of um, wall paintings were whitewashed during this era. A lot of reliquaries were lost, right? So reliquaries are these beautiful artworks that usually encase a relic. Uh, and a relic was a Catholic object that felt, uh, that was associated with a saint that had certain kind of powers and were very often venerated. Um, so these iconoclastic riots are important for us because it helps us to understand just how strongly a lot of Protestants felt about religious imagery. Because they felt so strongly about religious imagery, that means that we have a real shift that's going to occur in terms of how art is used in the North during the 16th century, as well as what art portrays. So instead of having religious stories in works of art that were often meant to be displayed in the churches or meant to kind of be devotional objects themselves, we're gonna see a real shift. Instead, in the 16th century, for Protestants, art's no longer going to be for religious use. That means we don't have a church that is paying for religious artworks anymore, and we see a shift in patronage. Uh, instead, most of the artworks from the North during the 16th century will be paid for by middle-class types of patrons. We also are going to see a shift in subject matter. So instead of having a really heavy emphasis on the stories from the Bible and the stories of Christianity, instead we see secular subject matters, so non-religious subject matters. Now, even though these are secular, they're still going to be moralizing. So let's talk more about these different kinds of things. Some of the secular subjects that become popular instead of religious subjects are still lives. Okay, still life is just this kind of pleasant arrangement of inanimate objects. Here we're looking at a butcher's stall. We also see a lot of portraiture, okay, and those can be self-portraits like we're seeing here by Durer, or it could be portraits of others. Those become very popular. We also see a lot of interest in landscapes. Landscapes, uh, as the name implies, are just beautiful views of nature. And we also see an emphasis on genre scenes. You know, genre scenes um, are just scenes of everyday life, something that could happen every day. It's kind of confusing because all of these other categories that we listed are genres of art. A still life is a genre of art. A portraiture, a portraiture is a genre of art. Landscape is a genre of art. And then one of those genres is called genre itself. And that's just the emphasis on the everyday. Even though these are secular subjects, right, we're not seeing a story from the Bible uh, very often in these works any longer, they are still moralizing. And there's two ways that we usually see that moralization coming through. The first is vanitas. Okay? In essence, uh, vanitas is just a warning against focusing on the vanities of the world, right? So um, worldly riches, for instance, or your looks, for instance. Another really common that we see is called memento mori. And this is just a reminder, everyone is going to die and you don't know when that death is going to come, right? You can't get away from it, but you should be at any moment prepared to meet your maker and prepared for that final judgment. So we're going to see these two in quite a few of the examples of the time. Let's look really quickly just at an image to kind of give you uh, some reference. This here is a portrait by Hans Holbein. It's called The Ambassadors. And we see across the bottom this kind of really interesting skull. It looks like a smudge 
but it is put in a very complicated type of perspective. And on the left, you can see a detail where they've kind of manipulated that perspective and you can see the skull. Uh, Holbein did this to show his sophistication and he based it upon the location where this portrait was originally meant to hang. But the skull was one of the most common symbols of vanitas and memento mori, right? This is obviously a reminder of death. And the meaning was when you saw something like this in 16th century works of art, and this carries on actually beyond the 16th century, uh, the meaning was for you to remember not to focus on the vanities of the world, but focus on things that were spiritually significant so that you would be ready to meet your maker at your final judgment, which could come at any time. Uh, we need to understand that in addition to having vanitas and memento mori as ways to moralize in these secular works of art, we have to understand that the literature that was produced during the time was also very influential on the subjects that we see in art. So we know that Gutenberg starts to popularize printing. He makes some refinements and the printing press becomes a, a much more streamlined process in the middle of the 15th century. And as we enter into Protestantism with Luther's recommendations that everyone should be able to read for themselves, we have increased literacy in the northern parts of Europe where many people are Protestant. And they're not only reading their Bibles, which are being printed by these printing presses, but they're also reading a lot of different types of literature that are being produced beyond Bibles. So there's a lot of secular literature and like the art of the time, even though it is not telling stories of Christianity, these works of literature very often are still moralizing. Uh, one type of literature that was really popular at this point in time were proverbial sayings. So there'd be whole texts and compendiums of proverbs that were printed. And they just use little secular stories or saying to have different moralizing meanings. Uh, we have a lot of interest, interest rather, in philosophical ideas as well in the secular works of literature. One of the popular kind of outlooks of the time is Christian humanism, which really emphasizes individual freedom and the ability for people to use their conscience to make good choices and be able to find happiness. Okay, so it's very moralizing and didactic in this way, uh, and it's very popular. We're looking here at a text by Erasmus in Praise of Folly. It was first printed in 1511. A lot of these Christian humanist texts, as Erasmus's, uses satire as a way to kind of point out the uh, potential for an individual to choose happiness by making good choices. Uh, and when they're using satire to make this point, a lot of times what they do is they show the stupid things that people do as kind of a warning. Don't you fall prey to these same choices. So in this book, we see a, a lot of emphasis on this character of Folly, uh, who has, you know, all these accompanying foibles and makes all sorts of, of silly choices and does silly kinds of things uh, throughout throughout the text. Uh, we're looking here at this image that has added little marginalia drawings that were added by Hans Holbein on one of the copies of this text in Praise of Folly that Erasmus himself owned. So within the text, um, Erasmus is pointing out foolish things that people do. He's even pointing out foolish things that he sees as problems within the Catholic Church. Uh, and he does this as a satirical kind of tool for people to be warned against making those same sorts of, of mistakes. We see a similar trend in works of art. Artworks like Christian humanism start to emphasize folly as a warning, right? A satirical warning. Don't be prey to making these same uh, silly mistakes. We're looking here at a detail from Bosch's Haywing Triptych, where people of all classes and all genders are just trailing after this overloaded cart of hay, this big hay wagon, and they're trying to claw at it and get some of it themselves. So they're being really greedy and they're being really ridiculous. And uh, the whole point of showing ridiculous acts like this is to advocate that people don't make the same sorts of mistakes. So those are the basics then of understanding what's going on historically that impacts art in a significant way 
for the northern parts of Europe in the 16th century. We have all of these calls for religious reform and the changes surrounding the Protestant Reformation that really changed the way the art was used. It was no longer used for religious purposes, as well as the subject matter of art. It was no longer religious in content, um, or rather overtly Christian in content, and became more secular. Instead, we start to see still lives, portraits, landscapes, and genre scenes used to teach moralizing lessons, especially through vanitas, or memento mori, or Christian humanism. We saw a shift in patronage from the church towards middle-class patrons as well.